several, several weeks ago, I started a series on, um, uh, thank you, spiritual warfare. And uh, I just want to kind of continue that. And uh, this, about two weeks ago, I think it was, we did a thing uh, it's talking about God's agent of a spiritual authority. God has an agent of spiritual authority. And you know who that is? It's you, the church, not individuals. I mean, we are individuals that God can use, but God is called the church, the church. That's where he gives his spiritual authority. That's where he gives the power to, to do the things that God has called us to do. And so I want to go off of that. Just like a police officer, they don't come at you in their name. Stop in the name of Fred. No, they say stop in the name of the law. The law is the authority. They are the agent of authority. And you and I are the church. God is our authority. The Holy Spirit is our authority and his righteousness is our authority. But you and I are that agent of authority where we can go in and say, hell, stop. Gates of hell no longer control the situation. Your plans are null and void because I hold the keys of heaven. And God has keys for every single thing that hell gates has ready to open up for us. And we are agents of authority. And when we as a church believe that and we gravitate towards that and we come together, I'll tell you what, hell look out. That almost sound pretty bad, didn't it? But <laughs> look out, hell, we're coming in Jesus' name because we are God's agent of authority. Matter of fact, the Bible says the gates of hell cannot stop the church. They cannot prevail, cannot. They are doomed. So if you, got, if you are a part of God's church, you're in a position where Jesus can stop hell in your life. But if you're not a part of God's church, you're not in the position where Jesus can stop hell from messing with your life. That's why we want to be in God's family. We're knitted together. We're in unity. Amen? Amen. All right, God has given us the keys. So today I just want to talk about, that was called a, um, the agent of authority, which is the church. Today I want to talk about the weapons of authority. So if you guys would... Uh, let's just pray. Grab a hold of your Bible. We're going to be using this today. Amen. So we're just going to pray right now. Dear Lord, I, again, I just want to say thank you for your word. It is alive. It is powerful. It is sharper than two-edged sword. It cuts everything coming and going. I pray that, Lord, you do surgery on our heart today by your word. I pray that your word would come into our lives and our hearts and come alive and just excite us for the things that you've called us to do. May our hearts beat with the word of truth today in it, in Jesus' name. And everybody's church, everyone in church said, thank you. Thank you for sticking with me, my flailings up here. So anyway, in Hebrews 6, Paul wants us to understand our weapons of authority. By the way, if you're going to do some fighting, you probably want some weapons, don't you? Bible's, Paul wants us to know about our weapons. These weapons are tools. They're equipment to do the things that God has told us to do, to fight our enemies, weapons of authority. Not only that, these weapons, uh, uh, the spiritual armor that we're going to talk about, they're there for us that they can fix our lives. There's a lot of Christians whose lives are messed up, are they not? And so you begin to wonder, are they Christians? And that's why people start judging, you know, if their life is good, they must be a good Christian. If their life is bad, they must be a bad Christian. Not always the case. Not always the case at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said that. The case is this, though. God has given us weapons to fight hell and to fight it off our family and to fight it off our own lives and also to fix what is broken in our life. Today, I wanna to talk about three areas of weapons of authority. The first area is called the need for the armor. The second area is the nature of the armor. And third is the names of that armor. Number one, the need of the armor, the need for the armor. There is a need for the armor of God. We are told that we are to, we need the armor to stand firm. You turn to your Bibles in Ephesians 6. We're going to start in chapter 10, and we're going to keep reading there. But right now, just go ahead. If you don't have it, look up here. But I do encourage you to use your word also. Ephesians 6, starting in chapter uh, verse 10. Here we go. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. In the first part of verse 14, it says, stand firm. If you look at that, verse 11, 
we got the command there to stand firm. Verse 12, stand firm. I'm sorry, verse 13 in that, the beginning of verse 14, stand firm. That is why we need the armor. We need the armor to stand firm. We do not, we do, why do we need God's armor? Listen to this. Why do we need God's armor? Because we are fighting angels. We're not fighting people. The worst person in your life is not your enemy. The devil is. That person just is just a vehicle which the devil is using to get into your life and to mess with you. And by the way, he's using you too. <laughs> Don't just think, oh, they're, a, they're a equipment for the devil. The devil uses us to mess with people's lives as well if we're not wise to it. So your biggest enemy, your worst person in your life is not your problem. They are only vehicles to which the angels are trying to get to you. The demons, angels, fallen angels. The worst situation in your life, your job, that's not your problem. That is only a vehicle in which Satan is attacking you. How many of you guys right now going through your head thinking, I know a person, <laughs> I know a situation. <laughs> that the devil's using them. They're agents of the devil. So don't, don't be thinking that, like I said, because the devil will use you as well. So, so we must have God's armor. Because if we try and fight it in our own power, see, if you're going to fight angels with your own hands and flesh, you have no authority. You have no power. You cannot fight angels in your own strength. You're worthless. You need God's armor. You need God's weapons. You need God's equipment in order to do this. Let's read verse 12. This is our enemies. Verse 12 says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, humans, but against evil rulers, Hear the hierarchy there? And authorities of the unseen world. You don't see demons, do you? And against mighty powers in the dark world. Is this too loud for you guys out there? Okay. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Do you hear that huge host of enemies that is out after us? That is who we are fighting. And that is why we need God's armor. That is the need for God's armor. You can't use human tools to win spiritual war. You've got to use God's armor. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says this, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. Here again, we're, in fighting, we're fighting an invisible war. We're fighting an invisible enemy in an invisible sphere. And when we fight this enemy, what happens? It affects us in our daily lives in which we're living right now that we see. This enemy who's invisible his weapons are invisible, his tools, his, his sphere, everything about him is invisible, except this. Even though it's invisible, it affects it, and we can see it in our daily lives, can't we? I've, I've seen the devil attack my life, and I've seen it. So what does God want us to do in all this thing? He wants us to stand firm. Now, why would God want us to stand firm in a war? Wouldn't he want us rather to attack to storm the gates of hell? Wouldn't he rather just go out and fight the enemy and try to cut them all up and whatever it may be to fight, go forward, not to just stay in area? Why is that? Here's the reason why, church, and we gotta understand this because once we understand this, this opens up a whole mindset for everything that we do. The reason why God has told us to stand firm and not to just go out and just start trying to do uh, uh, offensive victories is because Jesus Christ has already given us victory. Jesus Christ has already won the offensive battle. Jesus Christ has done this. We don't have to do it. And because Jesus has done it, we can stand firm in Jesus' victory. That's where our victory comes. Not when we go out and do the things. It's when we trust God and God has already done these things for us. He's already given us salvation. He's already fought the enemies. Matter of fact, uh, Colossians 2.14 says this. He canceled the, this is Jesus. Jesus canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers. He disarmed them, took away their weapons. He disarmed the authorities. He shamed them publicly in victory over them at the cross. So when Jesus died on the cross, took our sins, the Bible tells us that when he was in the grave, he wasn't just laying there. He went down into hell where Satan held God's people in the, in the, in the realm there, Hades, he held him there because at that time they couldn't go to heaven. He had the keys to the gates of hell and the grave. Jesus went down and defeated him, took an ugly stick and beat him ugly, <laughs> took the keys of hell and the grave away from him. So now we have victory in Jesus Christ. Jesus already fought the battle which we needed to be fought, but we couldn't do it. 
We needed Jesus. And now Jesus has given us the victory so we can stand firm. We can stand firm. Just like a football team. Say the score is 539. I did that on seven times, whatever it was. But anyway, 539 to zero. It's the fourth quarter. Do we need to go out there and score any more points? No, we need to stand firm. Don't let the enemy score anything against us. Don't let the enemy score anything against our lives and our family. The victory has already been won through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So we just need to stand firm in God's victory. Satan is trying to rob us. He's trying to rob us of our spiritual authority, our spiritual weapons, and our spiritual blessings which God has given us. Ephesians 3, 1, 8 says this. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. If you are a Christian, you are united with Christ and you have the victory that Jesus Christ has over Satan. It's just like you're going up with a big guy and he goes and beats up another guy and you're going, yeah, you deserve that. You do, you've done nothing. You're there with a big guy who beat the little guy. Say, so, yeah, that's your victory. But not only that, there is blessings that Jesus has for our lives. Every, the Bible says there, every, say every, every, nothing lacking. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly realms because we are united to Jesus Christ. So why would a millionaire go out and try and borrow some money when he has a million dollars in the bank? There's no need for it. There's no need for it. Many Christians act like spiritual paupers. I can't do this. I can't do that. When God has given us everything we need and all the victory in the spiritual realm, he has already done it. We don't have to do anything except stand firm on it and believe him. And stand firm. Because we don't understand our position in Christ, because we don't understand who, what he's done and we don't understand our position with him, we're united with him, we think that we have to go out and do a whole bunch of other victories and beating the devil here and there. Yeah, there's times for fighting, but I'm telling you right now, what God has called us to do in these evil times is to stand firm. Stand firm. The victory has already been won. So why stand firm? Here's the reason why. Verse 13, Ephesians 6, 13 says this. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. Why? So you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Or as King James says, in the evil day. You need to stand firm with God's armor so you can fight against, you can uh, resist the devil in the evil day. What's the evil day? You know, every Christian in here has a number. And uh, your number is going to be coming up. And, uh, matter of fact, uh, think of it this way. The devil is looking to Matter of fact, the devil went to Jesus. Jesus told Peter, and he says, Peter, Jesus is talking. The devil is asked to sift you like wheat. He's trying to test you. He wants to take you. He wants to take you out. But I've been praying for you. Every one of us has a number in here, and the devil's got your number. So if you're having a good day today, good. Enjoy it while it lasts. Because there's going to be an evil day that's going to come to you in your life. The devil's going to unleash hell on you in every way he can. Look at Job. What happened to Job? God allowed it. Why? Because God is there. He's given Job everything he needs. But right there, uh, hell was unleashed on Job. Job couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't do anything about his family dying. He couldn't do anything about his stuff stolen. Uh, he couldn't do anything about his servants killed. He couldn't do anything about his children killed. He couldn't do anything about his property destroyed. He couldn't do anything about it. And what did he do? He said this, yet the Lord may slay me. I will still trust him. He stood firm knowing that he belonged to God and that God has the victory in his life. He stood firm. So there's an evil day coming for every one of us. And that's why God says, I want you to stand firm. I've given you the ability to stand firm. Hallelujah for that. He didn't just throw you out there and say, you're on your own. He's given us every spiritual gift that we have. Our job is to stand firm in the victory that is already won. Can we say hallelujah for that? Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for the victory that's already there. That's why we give thanks. That's why we say, thank you, Lord. It reminds us of the victory that we already have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. When we pray, believe in God. Lord, I ask for this, and I thank you for it because of all the spiritual blessings you've given me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, stand firm. Now, be on your guard. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 16, 13a says, says this. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. But you have... You have to have the equipment to do that. And that equipment is the armor of God, which we're getting ready, getting ready to understand and read about. All right, the second point. That was the need 
why we need the armor of God. Now, the sec- that was the first thing. Now, the second thing is the nature of the armor. What is the nature of the armor in our life? Well, if you turn to Ephesians 6.10, it says this, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The nature of the armor is that it is God's armor. The armor is God's armor, not ours. Hallelujah, because you're going to find a kink in my armor. My armor is made out of tissue paper. You know, <laughs> Leave me alone. It's not going to work. It ain't going to happen. But we have God's armor, which is mighty. I like what the scripture says there. It is mighty in power, mighty in power. That is the armor of God. So that's the nature. The Lord's strength that enables us to stand firm. It is his strength. In other words, we have to dress for success. We need to put on Jesus. We need to dress to be victorious. We need to put on Jesus so that we can be victorious. Every piece of armor that we're getting ready to read about, there's six pieces. Every one of them, if you put them on, it's the same thing as putting on Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do. Get dressed up in Jesus every single day of your life. That's what he's called us to do. Let's re- look at Romans 13, 11 through 14. It says this. I'll read it to you. This is all the more the urgent for you to know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up. You know, I have the advantage of standing up here and looking at people, and I get to see who's all asleep. <laughs> There's a lot of sleepy Christians in this world, not just in the church, but I'm talking about in our own spiritual life. Wake up! God tells us to wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than it has ever been. We first, when we first believe, the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Put on Jesus Christ. Put on Jesus Christ, the armor of light. Because we belong to the day and we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of the wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity or in moral living or in quarreling or jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in your evil desires. We are told to dress for success. In order to do that, we have to put on Jesus Christ in our lives. And the armor of God represents putting on Jesus Christ. Because when the devil sees that armor, he doesn't see our face. He sees armor, and he sees something that's mighty and scary, and it's, whose armor is it? It's God's armor. So who does he think is behind that armor? God, Jesus Christ. (laughs) That's why we need to put on Jesus Christ every single day of our lives, and we're going to understand how to do that in a practical way. If you want to dress for success in a spiritual warfare, just like on your Sunday morning, you put on your Sunday best. Monday, put on your Monday best. Well, put on Jesus Christ every single day of your life. Amen? Put on Jesus Christ every single day of your life. The devil is trying to take your future. He's trying to take your promises. He's trying to take your joy. He's trying to take your purpose. And why? Because we have so many naked Christians running around out there. They don't have the spiritual armor on their lives. If you don't have God's spiritual armor in your life, you're just this naked Christian running around, and the devil can take and do anything he wants with you. We need God's armor to fight the devil off in our lives. Amen? I'm going to get a loud amen out of you one of these days. God says, if you just get dressed instead of living naked, I wrote that down so I wouldn't forget it. I thought it was funny. (laughs) Instead of living naked Christian life, the devil won't be able to steal this stuff from you anymore. He won't be able to steal your joy. He won't be able to steal your promises or your future. He can't do it because you've got the armor of God and he cannot win against it. Because why? It is God's armor. Amen? Hallelujah. The only thing that the devil was ever scared of is Jesus Christ. That is the only thing. You don't make him afraid. You don't make him shake in his boots. It's Jesus Christ. And if we put on Jesus Christ, he sees Jesus. And hallelujah, you just just want to chase after him. I got Jesus on. Ah, You know, just chase him everywhere. I've got Jesus on. That's what we're called to do. So put on Jesus. Put on his appearance. Put on his likeness. Put on his attitude. Devil won't be able to handle it. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) I crack up. Because if you could only see what's in my mind right now. You are Christ. You are dressed for success. All right, so we, we understand that we need the armor of God so we can defeat the devil, so we can stand firm in the evil days that are coming. And every single person is going to experience it multiple times maybe. We need armor. Now we understand the, the nature of the armor. The nature of the armor is Jesus Christ. 
and it's powerful. Hallelujah. Now, we want to know the names of the armor. And so today, I'm only going to touch on three, and I'm going to save three for next week. So, first one, the names of the armor. In Ephesians 6, 14a, it says this. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Number one, the first piece of armor is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. If you're going to get dressed up with Jesus, you're going to need a belt, which is truth. You're going to need something that is factual, that is real. We live in a world today where people say there is no such thing as true truth. Now, listen, listen to this. Listen to the hypocrisy. Now, you've got to catch this. If someone comes up to you and says, there is no truth, what do you say? Is that true? Well, I, it, well if, if there's no truth, that's not true. So shut up. There is truth. And the world would love to push it away. Then they say, okay, all right, there's truth, but... That may be true for you, but it's not true for me. I got my truth and you got your truth. We got a lot of truthy people out there. Roman soldier, when he had the belt on, he had a long tunic. And what he would do with that belt, he would come up and he would tuck it in that belt whenever he had to run, whenever he had to go into battle. Not only that, but this belt this had, had these uh, hooks on it, had these clips on it, so that when they put on their breastplate, it would snap to it and it would hold to them as well. So that truth was, that belt was there to help hold their, their armor as well. Not only that, also it's where he put his sword because if he had a sheath, he would attach it to the belt. So this belt is very, very important. And that's why we're told to put it on first. Why? Because we have to know what's true in a world that's full of non-truth. We've got to stand up and say, I know this is true and believe it and know why it's true. We got to know why it's true. God wants us to use our minds. He doesn't want Christians to just go out there with their feelings. That's wrong. That's wrong. We got to know what we believe and why we believe it. And we trust it because it's true. Now, let's put it this way. Like I said, we live in a time where people think, I have my opinion. You got your opinion. This is my opinion. I think, I think. And that's, there's no objective truth. There is such thing as objective truth. The devil will whip your backside without your belt. You need truth. You need to know what you believe. The devil is a liar, and Jesus says that he is speaking his native tongue. He's always been a liar. So if the devil could go into an area where there's people who do not know the truth, or who are not firm in the truth, he has a heyday of messing with your life. That's why a lot of Christians are defeated. Why? Because they don't know the truth. They don't know the Word of God. And if they don't have that truth, the devil comes in and lies to them. The devil tried to do it to Jesus Christ when he was tempting him out in the wilderness. He tried his best to do it. He even told him some things. If this is that, and Jesus came back and gave him the truth. Gave him the truth. So the devil thought, well, I, I know the Bible too. I'll throw it back at you, Jesus. The word of God says, if you do this. So he's trying to twist the truth. That's called perversion. The devil is a pervert. And all he does is pervert things and twist things. He is a liar, Jesus tells us. And everything he speaks is a lie. So if he can get into an environment where people do not have a truth or not establish the truth, he will mess with your life and he will confuse you. It's like, why? That's why a lot of teens walk away from the truth because they do not, they're not planted in this thing here called God's word. They don't know what's true. They live in schools today. A lot of schools today says, well, there really is no truth. This is true for them and this is true for that religion. This is true for you and this could be true for you as well. You, you don't want that. You're not gonna believe that. You don't want individual beliefs. Suppose you have a doctor who says, well, you know what? A surgeon, you know, I believe I should cut here, <laughs> but this surgeon says I should cut there, and that surgeon says I should cut there, but I believe I should cut right here. You're, you're going to want truth there, aren't you? <laughs> Suppose you have a pharmacist. You know what? I have this medicine, but I, I think this is a medicine that you should use. I know the pharmacist over there says you should have that, and the doctor says you should have this medicine, but I believe and I feel that you should have this. You're going to want that pharmacist to have truth. Suppose the pilot's in an airplane. I think this button's the button I ought to push. <laughs> You're not going to want that. You're going to want the truth. And if they're not going to do the truth, and they're not going to give you the truth, you're going to sue them because they don't have the truth. You need the truth. Your pharmacy has to have it. Your doctor has to have it. Your pilot has to have it. You and I have to have it. Why is it that we can trust them with the truth, but we can't trust God's yes and amens? We need to trust God. We need to trust his word. And it's true, and we can prove it. It can be proved. That's, that's why I love apologetics. I, I get online, I read these blogs, and there's so many brilliant philosophers out there, so many brilliant scientists out there, so many brilliant scholars out there, and everything is out there, points to God. Science and God are not at odds. Science 
proves there's a God. Every single time, except for bad science. And science says, I don't want to believe in God, so I'm going to make up my own truth. <laughs> that's the devil. I just gave you the devil right there. See, that's why bad science comes in. It, does, it doesn't want to believe in a God. It doesn't want to believe the truth, so it makes up its own truth. We got to know the truth, and everything points to God, the Word of God, and it is true. Satan is winning over a lot of us. Why? Listen to this. It's because how we feel is more important than what God says. I want to say that again slowly. How we feel is so much more important to us than what we read here. I know God's Word says that, but I don't want to do that. My heart is set on this. You don't understand my circumstances because the word of God wouldn't apply to that circumstance. And so I, I understand it better than God. And this is how I feel about it. That's why so many Christians are defeated because they go by their feelings. Hallelujah. They go by their feelings. We don't want to live our lives by our feelings. The devil will mess with us. He will win every single time. And when you go by your feelings, you're not wearing the belt of truth. You're not wearing the belt of truth. And so therefore, you're not wearing the armor of God. And so therefore, you're not winning victories in your life. The devil is. You need, you and I both need the belt of truth. So how does this relate to Jesus Christ? John 14, 6 says this. And you can say it with me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's say it together. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is the truth. He is the living truth. This is the word of God. This is the word of truth. And Jesus is the living truth. We can trust Jesus Christ. So when other religions come up and say, when you see those bumper stickers that say coexist and they have all the different religious symbols, that's a lie. That is a lie. Don't believe it because Satan wants to steal you. It's not these people trying to confuse it. The devil's using them, remember? They're blind. And they actually believe that stuff. Why? Because they don't have any truth in which to put their faith in and to put their life in. They believe what they feel. Hallelujah. So let's get up and get dressed with the truth. Let's walk around with, what is that? We need to walk around with a viewpoint that God is truth. God is truth. People are going to call you arrogant when you say this. I believe people are going to call you narrow-minded. That's a good one. They're going to call you narrow-minded. Let's put it this way. If I have a heart problem, I don't want the doctor cutting on my leg. I want him to narrow it to my heart. <laughs> Amen. Uh, if, if, uh, if there's a people who's going down a one-way street, I don't want them to feel like, ah, I want to go down this one-way street this direction, the opposite direction. I want them to be narrow-minded. I want them to do the narrow road. Why is that? Because broad is the road that leads to destruction, and narrow is the path that leads to life. The devil wants you to believe anything and everything and go with your feelings, and that will take you in a million different directions, and it's not narrow-minded. And what happens, the Bible says, broad is the road that leads to destruction and to death. But narrow is the path that leads to Jesus Christ, to God, to life. And that narrow road is Jesus Christ. Amen. That is the truth. So truth, be narrow-minded. When they tell you that, say, hallelujah, thank you. I am narrow-minded. I am narrow-minded. Amen. So we have to be narrow enough to say, listen, you and I have to be narrow enough to say, this is true. This is not true. Is that being mean? No. The devil will make you feel like, I'm being mean. You know, they won't accept me. I'll hurt their feelings. They're going to remember you when they're burning in hell thinking why they, they were trying to tell me something but they didn't finish it. We can say this is true, amen? We can say this is not. Why? By the authority of Jesus Christ, by the belt of truth, by his word, amen? Second piece is the breastplate of righteousness. In the New Living Translations in Ephesians 6, 14, the second half of it says this, and the body armor of God's put on the body armor of God's righteousness. In King James, it says this, put on the breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, remember, we said put on Jesus every morning. Jesus represents these different pieces of the armor. So we're to put on Jesus. In Jeremiah 33, 16, it says this, God is our righteousness. God is our righteousness. So we need to put on God. We need to get dressed with God and he will protect us. So we got the belt of truth, and after the truth, now we can move to the heart. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does this mean? This means to commit yourself to living a holy life. To put on the breastplate of righteousness means I'm committing myself to live a holy life, which God has called me to live. Most Christians don't know what happens when we're saved. We believe that 
Jesus Christ forgave my sins. But he did more than that. He did more than that. The second thing he did this, he, the Bible tells us that God gave us Jesus' righteousness. See, we've been trying to make ourselves right with God all along, but we try to do it in our own good works. The Bible calls that our own filthy rags of righteousness. We try to do things God's, we try to do things our way and we think it's right. And the Bible says that stinks like filthy rags. I want, it'll never let you in. You cannot get into heaven with the filthy rags of your own righteousness. We need someone else's righteousness. So if we can't get it, who's are we gonna get? The Bible says Jesus is our righteousness, amen? So we need to put on Jesus Christ and he is our righteousness. We don't want to wake up saying, I'm going to be righteous today. I'm going to do everything right today. You know what you're doing? You're trying to do everything in your own power, in your own might, and that's nothing. That's not putting on the armor of God. What we need to do is know that, number one, Jesus Christ is righteous, and because he has made me righteous, I don't have to try and be righteous. He has already made me righteous by giving me his righteousness. God has put his righteousness on me, and now I am made right by Jesus's righteousness. That's how we do that sort of thing. We, first of all, what we have to do is start with the position. Number one, Jesus Christ is righteous. Now I can live righteous. We don't try and live righteous and to work it up so we are righteous. No, we already are made righteous by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He made us righteous. And now we can live like that. It's just like the queen of England. Suppose she has her daughter. And her daughter, she's slouching in her chair. And the queen says, what are you doing slouching? The queen doesn't slouch. Now you set up. She knows who she knows who she is. She know she knows she knows who she is. <laughs> she knows who she is. She is the queen. And she knows as a queen I have to set up and I can set up. But if you don't know your queen, you're just going to continue slouching and whatever, you know. <laughs> whatever non-queens do. <laughs> it's the same thing with us. If we don't know who we are in Jesus Christ, we can't be like Jesus Christ. We got to know who Jesus Christ is and what he's already done for us. 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and listen to this, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So church, if you've asked Jesus Christ into your life and asked him to forgive you for your sins, you are made righteous through Jesus Christ. The Bible says he puts on his robe of righteousness on you. He takes your filthy rags off and he puts on his righteousness. So now we don't stink. We can come into the wedding feast of God and enjoy the things of God. We wear Jesus' righteousness. So instead of trying to do things on our own, trying to get up and make ourselves live right, we need to get dressed up in the morning thanking God. Now hear this, church. We need to be thanking God for his righteousness. You'll find that you'll, number one, you'll be living a life more holy than you ever have before because you're not doing it in your own strength. You're not doing it in your own mind. You're saying, God, thank you that you made me righteous this morning. Hallelujah. Listen, this is a practical thing. God, thank you that you've made me righteous this morning. Thank you that you made it possible I could be righteous through Jesus Christ. I receive it, and now I will live like it, and I will act like it, and I will talk like it, and I will be righteous because Jesus Christ has made me righteous. Amen? Hallelujah. Matter of fact, if you look at the uh, book of Ephesians, which we're studying in now, it's six chapters. The first three chapters tells us who we are in Jesus Christ. And the, sec- the last three chapters tells us how to live. You've got to know who you are before you can know how to live. You are righteous because of Jesus Christ. Now you can live that way. And so that's what Ephesians tells us. So let's continue on here. So if you don't, if you don't, it's just like eagles soaring with turkeys. You know, you're not soaring, you're walking around with turkeys. You guys are eagles. You're eagles. But you've got to know you're an eagle before you can soar like an eagle. If you hang around turkeys all the time, you're going to act like a turkey. So we don't need to do that. So we have to understand we are eagles. We are gods. We are made righteous through Jesus Christ when we confess our sins to him. And now we can act like a Christian. Amen? Hallelujah. If you don't put on Jesus' righteousness, what happens? You will have an environment where demons could foster. If you have unrighteousness, if you have unholy living, if you're, not, if you're living for yourself, if you're living in an unholy way, that fosters demon activity in your life. And you don't want that. Amen? We want the breastplate of righteousness attached to the belt of truth. And the third piece, the final piece I'm going to talk about today, and then we'll get the others next week, is the shoes of the gospel of peace. The shoes of the gospel of peace. In Ephesians 6, 15, it says this, For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In Ephesians 2, 14, it says that Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. 
So we're still talking about getting dressed with Jesus Christ. And when the Bible says Jesus is our peace, we need to put on Jesus Christ so that we can have that peace in our life as well. The Roman soldier wore shoes that had cleats on it. Why? So that he could be sure-footed when it was slippery. He would not slip. How many Christians say, oops, I slipped. Oops, I slipped. Uh, oops, I slipped. And it's just like, I finally give up. We need God's peace so that we can be sure-footed and know where we stand and stay standing and stand firm, amen? Stand firm in the armor of God. So we need to be sure-footed. So we need to live on truth. We need to live in righteousness. The peace of God will guard your hearts. If you do those things, the peace of God will guard your hearts. I wanna give you a little bit of theology real quick here. There is a peace of God, which is good feelings, and then there's a peace with God. So many people like the peace of God because they like that good feeling that I'm, I'm right, I'm, I'm okay. But they don't have, sometimes they don't have the peace of God. What is this? The peace of God comes when we are made right with Jesus Christ. See, if you're not on God's side, you're not at peace with God. The devil's on your side. If you're not a born-again Christian, if you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you do not have the peace with God. You are enemies with God. The Bible says this, if you're not a Christian, you are an enemy. I'm an enemy with God if I'm not a Christian. But once we ask Jesus into our life, Jesus makes us right, and now we can are at peace with God, and we can have the peace of God. You cannot have the peace of God without having, knowing God. What does that sign say? If there's no God, there's no peace. If you know God, you can know peace. The only way to know peace is to know God and to be made right and to be made correct, right standing with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We need to have peace with God before we can have the peace of God. We want God on our side. Um, because you started with understanding, because you understand why we need the armor of God in this evil days, and we can have evil family members, we can have evil jobs, we can still know that, man, God, you're on my side. I can have that peace knowing, even though I, I'm a Christian, even though my life is all messed up, even though hell is unleashed on me because it's evil days, I can have the peace of God. Why? Because God is on my side. I've made peace with God through Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm made right with God. I can have peace with him. I'm no longer his enemy. And because of that, it doesn't matter what happens. You can have peace. How do Christians have peace? What is this peace that passes understanding? It's when you know that you're saved. I'm at peace with God. He's on my side. He's on my side so we can have the peace of God. If you ask God to forgive you for your sins, you can know this peace. I'm just gonna move on ahead here. I wanna give you a quick story. There's a, uh, there's this family, it was actually a cruise ship where a whole bunch of Christians got together and they got on this cruise ship and they went to this place. They had to get back in time to pick up another group of people, so they left early. I mean, they left on time, but in doing so, they would have to go through this huge storm. So here's this cruise liner going through this huge storm. As a matter of fact, the captain says it was the worst storm that that particular ship had ever encountered since it was constructed. 30-foot waves. People were all over going, blah, blah. You know, just, <laughs> they were sick. They were in their cabins. And like, matter of fact, one of the people called up, wanted to talk to the captain. What's going on? <laughs> Why are you doing this? And he said, he actually answered back. He says, you know what? You can, you know what? The, this, I want you to know that this ship was built with these storms in mind. This ship was constructed in such a way that it can take these 30-foot waves. It can take all this rocking. You can be sure that this ship is going to see you through. You're going to be safe. And I'm the captain. You can go to sleep, and I'll take care of it for you. And it's the same with Jesus Christ. When we have peace with God, and we know that God is on our side, we can know that no matter what happens in our life, God is strong enough to handle the situation just like that boat. Whatever storm that you and I may be in, God is there and he is strong enough and he's saying, go to sleep. I'll take care of it. What, what was Jesus Christ? Remember he was in the boat and that storm came along? He was asleep. Why? Because he had peace with God. He knew what, where he was going to go and he knew what was going to happen. So he had peace with God. He went to sleep in the midst of a storm. He had peace of God in his life. And so we can have the same thing when we put God into our life. When we put on the belt of truth, we attach the breastplate of righteousness, we've shot our feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. When we have peace with our Lord and our Savior, and we know that God is on our side, we can stand firm. Amen? We can stand firm. Why? Because God is on our side. Jimmy, if you can...